So I'd like to welcome everyone once again to Amateur Astronomers Incorporated for our weekly Fridays at Home presentations. As you, many of you know, AAI makes its home at the William Miller Sperry Observatory, which is located on the campus, on the campus of Union County College in Cranford, New Jersey. But due to the pandemic at this time, the observatory is closed and therefore we are continuing to hold our weekly presentations online. Now on the third Friday of each month from September to April, we hold our monthly meetings, which include guest speakers from educational institutions around the country. And we're very fortunate tonight that our speaker is Mr. Arjun Savell. He's a PhD candidate at the University of Maryland and he's a graduate of the University of California at Berkeley, majoring in receiving his bachelor's degrees in astrophysics and physics. The title of his presentation is Colors in the Shadows, Exoplanet Atmosphere. So with that, Arjun, you can begin. Thank you so much, Mary, for the introduction. So yes, I'm Arjun Savell, and I'll be speaking about exoplanet atmospheres today. I'm very keen on them. So I think we'll go ahead and just get started. So I think we'll start out just with some basic definitions. What is an exoplanet? It seems like a relatively simple question, just what is the thing I'll be talking about for the next hour? But truthfully, we don't have a quite definitive answer yet when it comes down to distinguishing them. What everyone can agree on is, at the most fundamental level, an exoplanet is a planet that is outside of our solar system. For example, orbiting a star other than our good old sun. But again, it's within the categories that there's some disagreement. So I'll present some preliminary classifications today just so we can get a picture in our head of what's going on. But I would like you to keep in mind that, again, not everyone would agree with me on this. So to start off, I'll begin with an Earth-sized planet because that's probably the type of planet with which we are all most familiar. These planets tend to be predominantly rocky, and they can have a thin layer of atmosphere surrounding them, though they need it, as we'll find out. Next, we have super-Earths. And as you might be able to glean from the name alone, they're just a lot like Earth-sized planets. They're just super. They're larger. And again, they can also have this thin atmospheric layer encasing them. But once you start to move above about one and a half times the Earth's radius, the bulk properties of your planet start to change drastically. Namely, you start to become predominantly gas dominated. And those gases largely being hydrogen and helium, the most common elements in the universe. You keep on adding stuff to your planet, increasing its size, and you get to a point where they tend to resemble Jupiter in terms of size. And anything bigger than that, we'll also just call it roughly Jupiter-sized. And you might be wondering, OK, well, based off of this classification, what's the difference between a big Jupiter-like planet, just keep on adding more mass, what's the difference between that and a star? And that is where the classification starts to get a little bit murkier. What a lot of people will say is that it comes down to something called deuterium fusing. So deuterium is a form of hydrogen. You just add another neutron onto it, and you have deuterium. And what we'll say is that, OK, if there are interesting nuclear things happening to your deuterium in the center of your object, that's no longer a planet. That's a star. So all the things that we'll be talking about today, predominantly, are below that limit. They tend to fall, not neatly, but they'll fall within these classification regimes. And I'll tend to call back to this classification routinely. So. Now we know what exoplanets are loosely. So how do we find them? How do we observe them? There are a number of different ways to go about doing this. But today I'll be predominantly talking about my favorite and the most prolific method of exoplanet observation, which is the transit method. And the reason I like it so much is because I feel like it's a very physical mechanism. Let's watch and see what happens. We're observing a star. We're trying to determine how much light we're receiving from the star over time. At first, nothing much is happening, just a flat line, and then a dip. As the orbiting planet passes between us and its host star, physically blocking the amount of light that we receive from it. 
we are literally in the shadow that is cast by this orbiting planet. We'll watch it again and see what happens. Again, flat line, it's orbiting, and it has to be in this configuration. It has to be lined up just right so the planet passes between us and the star. The larger the planet, the larger the dip, because it's blocking more of its host star's light. Great. So now we know what planets are, and we know one relatively common way to find them. But we're not just interested in finding planets. We're not just interested in finding out how large they are. We'd like to know what's in their atmosphere. And to do that, we apply that same technique, that same transit technique, and we just do it for a variety of different colors. So first we say, okay, well, this is how much light we're receiving from the star that's red, and then the planet blocks some of that light, and then it doesn't block it anymore. And we repeat that, orange, green, blue, violet, great. What do we do with this information next? We map this information into a different representation. So on this y-axis, we have transit depth. That's just how much light is actually being blocked. Because it turns out that that changes depending on what color you're observing this transit in. Now, the actual color information itself, we represent that now in terms of wavelength of the light. So different colors of light can be represented in terms of the wavelength of the photons that make up that light. So combining those two bits of information, how deep the transit is, and what color each of these observations of the transit are in, we can get a, these types of points and represent them in this graph. So now that we have these points, OK, we have this data, what do we do with it? Well, we say, OK, I know some physics. I know some chemistry. I'm going to put all of that together in a computer and come up with a model that explains these points relatively well. And the reason that coming up with this line, this model, is important is because it then allows us to back out what atomic species and mole molecules are inside of this atmosphere in gaseous forms. Because each of these different types of molecules, water, methane, carbon monoxide, they all preferentially absorb light in different colors. So water, for example, it will absorb more light at one and a half micrometers than it does at other wavelengths, rather than 0.5 micrometers, for example. So ideally, we can take this information of how deep was this transit, which color, and be able to, from that, answer the question of, OK, what's inside this exoplanet atmosphere? Now, I'll say that this is an idealized case, because as we'll find out, it's not quite as simple a picture as I'm painting right now. So we have a sense of how to find exoplanets and how to determine what's in their atmospheres. But before we even look outside of our solar system, before we start looking at these objects, we might want to go in with a preconceived notion of, well, what are we even looking for? What might we expect? So we can start with the planets that are right in our backyard, the solar system planets. And we can start with this nice NASA illustration that neatly puts all the planets next to each other so that I can talk about them in a line. So we can start with these innermost planets, these rockier ones. They tend to be, as I mentioned, dominated by rock. And some of them, Venus and Earth, have an atmosphere that is relatively substantial. But that relatively substantial atmosphere kind of pales in comparison to what you see when you move farther out into the solar system. These gas giants, aptly named, are really dominated by this gas. Again, hydrogen, helium, the most dominant elements in the universe. So even just looking in our solar system, we start to see that there's a lot of variety in what an exoplanet could give us from an atmospheric perspective. And if we focus on one of those planets, the Earth, we can see striking complexity in weather, as many of us might be familiar with. I experienced the first hurricane of my life this fall when I moved to the East Coast. And massive, complex systems like those are really difficult for us to model far out into the future. We can say with some certainty that there is going to be a hurricane next year, 
but we can't really say how strong it'll be, when it'll occur, where it'll make landfall. And we're on this planet. <laughs> we can't predict weather and atmospheric conditions into the future with absolute certainty for the planet that we're standing on. So we can start to appreciate how this becomes a difficult problem trying to model and understand the atmospheres of planets and exoplanets that can be hundreds of light years away with very limited data. And the complexity doesn't stop at the upper layers of our own atmosphere. Take Jupiter, for example. This isn't some watercolor painting. This is what Jupiter actually looks like. The colors might actually be fudged a little bit, but a lot of those features, those swirls, those eddies, those currents, those are all physical features of this planet. So again, it starts to be a complex problem that we're anticipating that we'll have to deal with. And when we look outward, we found that the complexity didn't decrease. If anything, we looked outward and the complexity increased. And we started to see things that really didn't look like anything that we have in our own solar system. So I'll start us off with a simulation. And this is just one simulation, but it's relatively representative of a large class of planets. So I think it's worth walking through. Now, these two graphs both represent similar data for the simulation. Um, these grids are in latitude and longitude. The colors correspond to temperatures on the planet. And in this top graph, you have arrows. And the boldness and the direction of the arrows correspond to winds that are in this exoplanet. So the stronger, the bolder the, the arrows, the stronger the winds. The first thing that we might notice about this planet is that it's very, very hot. That's right, that's 1,200 degrees Kelvin at the top of that bar over there. And converting that to Fahrenheit, you get somewhere north of 1,700 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, for those of us who don't live our lives thinking in terms of Kelvin. So that's very, very hot. Not something that we see on the surface of our own solar system planets. We also tend to see a very, very significant eastward wind. And when I say significant, I mean on the order of kilometers per second. So this is really, really something, and something, again, we don't really see on the Earth, at the very least. And because of that wind, we start to see some relatively interesting physics that we don't see on the Earth. The hottest point on this planet isn't directly beneath the star. If you were to look up and see the star directly above you, you wouldn't be on the hottest point of the planet. In fact, because of these winds, the hottest point of the planet is actually advected eastward. All of that heat is just pushed over. So we can start again to appreciate how strong these gale force winds really, really are. And while I did mention that this is a model, this is not some observed data that we're looking at, this has been validated against a variety of different observational data sets. Sorry, muted. <laughs> Before we go on, speaking of truly unreasonable temperatures, I'd like to take a brief tangent and do a visualization exercise. I'd like you to imagine that you are getting ready for work and you grab your coat and you step outside and something's falling from the sky. You notice that it's rain, but something's wrong about this rain. A drop falls and it burns a hole through the ground in front of you. Because it's not water that's falling from the sky, it's molten iron. And I'm being a little facetious with the story, yes, um, but the gist of this tangent, the iron rain, that's the important bit. Because as it turns out earlier this year, we think we found iron rain out there in the galaxy on the planet WASP-76b. So let's take a trip to WASP-76b and the question of iron rain. So this is a figure that's been adapted from the discovery paper. And I think it's worthwhile to walk through and pick out some of the key points because it illustrates some of the advantages and disadvantages of observing these planets in the way that we do. So first of all, 
each of these inset figures represents a diagram of this planet at a different point in its orbit. And those different points are also shown above here, one, two, and three. This solid line that's shooting through this planet, that's pointing directly to the star. And at each point in its orbit, as it marches along, orbiting its host star, the same side of WASP-76b is always facing its star, much like how the same side of the moon is always facing the Earth. And because of this, we start to see some very exacerbated temperature differences. This side of the planet that's always facing its star, that's in perpetual sunlight, starlight rather, that's going to be very, very hot on the order of a couple thousand degrees Kelvin. By contrast, the night side, perpetual night, always looking out into the empty darkness of space, that's going to be much, much, much colder. So how does this stark difference manifest itself in terms of what we observe? and in terms of my nice iron rain story. So let's take a closer look at this diagram. This green bit over here represents the hottest point on the planet. And just like that simulation I showed before, the hottest point isn't directly under the star because you have these winds just whipping around this planet and infecting all the heat to the east. So here's your hottest point. And it's so hot in that hottest point that you don't actually have molten iron. You actually have gaseous iron, iron in the gas phase. So let's see what happens to this gas phase iron. It gets spread out over the planet because of winds, etc. And this planet, as I mentioned, is going to rotate as it moves through its orbit because it wants to keep the same face facing its host star. And as it moves through this, we notice that this green region comes in contact with this bar at the bottom. This bar at the bottom representing starlight that is filtered through the planet's atmosphere. Because here's the key bit. We can't see and collect data on the entire atmosphere. We can only collect data based off of where the starlight gets filtered through, this bottom bar and this top bar. So rewinding to the beginning in this first inset, we don't really see much iron gas. I look at my data, looking at this planet at this point in time and say, okay, there's not much iron gas in this atmosphere. But then a little while later, I say, wait a minute, there's a lot of iron gas in this atmosphere. So this difference beginning to end, no iron gas to a lot of iron gas, that actually tells me something else. That tells me that there isn't iron gas all around the planet that it's only on one point. And that iron gas doesn't just magically disappear. It has to go somewhere, right? Well, as I mentioned, there's a big temperature difference from the hot side to the cold side. So as this iron gas travels from the hot side to the cold side, it cools so much that it condenses and rains out. Hence, we think iron rain. So that's the story that's being painted by this observational paper. And there's a lot of really interesting theoretical work that is gonna come afterward, we hope, to kind of buttress these claims and really be able to dig into what are the physical processes that need to happen in order to really make this picture reality. So it doesn't just stop at gaseous iron for some planets. For some of them, the amount of radiation that they receive from their host star is so intense that over time they can become stripped of this atmosphere altogether. Now, the time scales of this atmospheric loss can vary dramatically. And you can calculate them to explain why a planet doesn't have an observed atmosphere. For example, I were to go observe some planet and try to make measurements of its atmosphere, and I find out oh, actually, it turns out this planet doesn't have an atmosphere. I can then go back to my whiteboard, do some calculations and say, okay, well, based off of how far this planet is away from its host star, how big this planet is, and how massive it is, it should lose its atmosphere if it were to have one in about a billion years, let's say. And if I were to look closely at its host star, 
and do some analysis on its host star, I could say, wait a minute, well, that host star is 5 billion years old. So it makes sense that I'm looking at a planet that doesn't have an atmosphere because it would have lost it around 4 billion years ago. But this whole idea of atmospheric loss doesn't just mean that we'll end up looking at some desiccated planets devoid of atmospheres. It actually leads to some really interesting observational cases. We can witness planets that are losing their atmospheres live in real time. Let's see what that looks like. Around five years ago, the planet GJ436b, and it turns out that you end up with something that's somewhat similar actually to that previous illustration where you have this tail of gas that's being wafted away from this planet over time. And again, this is not enough to destroy the atmosphere altogether. This is a very large, very massive planet. So relative to the amount of mass it holds, it's not losing all that much, but it's definitely losing enough for us to witness it. So this inset over here shows the zoomed out picture of what we think is happening. And this larger graph shows something that's a little closer to the observables. We observed some gas that's moving away from us at most 20 kilometers per second. Again, kilometers per second, very, very fast. And we observed some gas that's moving toward us at 120 kilometers per second. And when we piece all of those velocities together and throw it into our physics machine, it tells us, yeah, this picture is somewhat accurate. So again, atmospheric loss can actually lead to exciting observations real time. This is happening right now to some poor planet out there. So one of my favorite sentences ever in a scientific paper is two words, magma matters. And from what we think, this is true. Aside from just being cool to think about, magma oceans could play a very instrumental role in the formation and in the sculpting of an exoplanet atmosphere. Because it turns out all these horrible heating effects that I've talked about, thousands of degrees Kelvin, that can have really strong consequences. One of which being that the entire surface of your planet could be lava. And this is a brief aside for any Star Wars fans. Yes, this may look familiar, not making this up. And the reason that we believe that there are these magma oceans, that there are these lava worlds, is it just comes down to the property of rock. We know that rocks, once you heat them up enough, they will melt. And we know we can point out a planet and say, okay, well, you are this big and you have this much mass. So if I compute how dense you are, you're probably made of rock. And given how close you are to your host star, all that rock is probably lava on the surface. Over time, this exoplanet could cool, and it could cool for a variety of reasons that I'd be happy to go into more. But as it cools, you could get this interesting lid over this magma ocean soup covering this planet. And over time, this lid could also develop some ominous cracks in it that are reminiscent of this picture of Kilauea for NASA. So just to motivate some of the processes um, within a magma ocean and how it's actually relevant to an exoplanet atmosphere. Again, it's not just cool to think about, it actually plays a role in the observables, what we're thinking about, these atmospheres around these planets. And there were a variety of different ways that a magma ocean could come into play. And these all depend on, for example, how the exoplanet formed, when it formed, where it formed. But again, here's a representative example. And it largely consists of interactions between hydrogen and iron and oxygen. These atomic and molecular species in the atmosphere can get dissolved into your magma soup. In addition, you can have these electron interactions electron exchange interactions between the species in your atmosphere and species in your magma. So it's a relatively complex picture. And for a large class of planets, you can't quite ignore it. You'll have to consider it in your modeling. Things can get even messier, though, 
we've already talked about planets that are locked into facing their star one way. And we've talked about entire worlds covered in lava. But uh, yeah, it can get even worse than that. And one situation in which it can get worse is for planets on an eccentric orbit. To back things up a little bit, most of the planets in our own solar system, here are a few of them, are on basically circular orbits. But it turns out that any celestial orbit is actually going to be elliptical, thanks to Kepler, who figured that out. It's just that some orbits look more like an ellipse, more like ovalish, and some look more circular. And for example, HD 80606 is an extreme case of an eccentric planet that's on a very, very, very oval shape. It's very far from circular. Also, a brief side note about exoplanet names. They all tend to come across like telephone numbers, but this is one of those telephone numbers that people in the community can just kind of rattle off because this is a very exciting one, but we didn't really represent that in the naming of the planet. Anyways, HD 80606, it spends most of its time hanging out in this cooler region of its orbit. But then when it comes in around, it whips around its host star really quickly, getting flash heated before it's spun out again into the colder region of its orbit. So to kind of give a quantitative sense to what that means, what does that mean in terms of the observables that we've talked about this far? We're gonna look again at another latitude longitude grid with temperatures as our colors and winds as our arrows. On a circular orbit, a planet such as this would have a temperature wind structure that looks something like this, maybe reminiscent of the earlier one we looked at. It's the hottest a bit away from the center where we'd expect, it's hottest right over here. And there are some eddies, some places where winds get caught into circular regions. On an eccentric orbit, the overall picture looks roughly the same in that we have a very, very strong eastward wind and we have the hottest region that isn't directly underneath the star. But the problem is, is the picture is kind of amplified. That wind is even stronger and to me, looks much more directed in that direction. So again, the things that we've learned thus far still do apply to these eccentric planet cases. But now we have to consider this whole other complicating dimension. On the bright side, it does allow us to explore some really interesting time-dependent phenomena. If your planet is heating and cooling and heating and cooling, there could be a lot of really interesting physics and a lot of really interesting chemistry taking place. So it provides really unique opportunity in some cases from an observational standpoint. So I've talked a lot about the horrible, horrible aspects of some of these planets from a human perspective. So I'd like to briefly talk about something a bit more amenable to those of us who are probably in the audience today. One of the big discoveries in the last year was water vapor in the atmosphere of a habitable zone planet. And I'll re return to the habitable zone discussion and put a pin in that. Some people, including the incredible Courtney Dressing, who mentored me during my undergrad days at UC Berkeley, uh, found evidence of this water vapor up in the cloud regions of K218b. But I would like to note the question mark that I put next to water, because some people dispute the presence of this water in this atmosphere and instead attribute it to something like methane. And the reason that they think it might be methane, if we think back to our picture earlier, where we had the transit depth per wavelength, and we had those wobbles. And some of those wobbles we could attribute to some molecules, some to others. The problem is, sometimes the wobbles from different molecules tend to overlap. So it's not as cut and dry as pointing to something and say, hey, I know that that's water there. It's a really difficult thing to do. And there's a lot of statistics, a lot of physics involved. So at the very least, the example of K218b is a prime example of science being this ever evolving conversation, especially when it comes to the most exciting claims like water in the habitable zone. And at best, it's a very clear milestone in the efforts to find an Earth 2.0. Because for many people in the community, one of the most interesting aspects of exoplanets is to be able to say that 
might be something very much like the Earth from a size standpoint, from a mass standpoint, and as interesting as today, an atmospheric standpoint. So returning again to that pin about the habitable zone, the, I think the habitable zone idea plays into why it's a difficult and nuanced conversation to have about what water vapor in the habitable zone means. To illustrate this, here's a plot where we can see on the y-axis the size of planets, and on the x-axis the insulation flux of planets. Insulation flux being the amount of radiation received from a host star. And they're in units of the amount of radiation that the Earth receives from the sun. And plotted all these little green squares, those are all the exoplanets that are confirmed and that we know about. Now, each of these boxes shows a different conceptualization of what habitable Earth-like means with respect to these two parameters. So we can see, even when we're just treating two parameters, how much light you're getting, how big your planet are, planet is, we start to see some disagreements and some back and forth. Not all these boxes are lining up with one another. And ideally, everyone would like to agree on one aspect of the habitable zone, the idea that it's this region away from your star at which you're able to host liquid water. But when you get down to the physics of what that actually means, that's when you start to see some disagreements and some slight discrepancies. So again, it's very exciting, the K218b example, but there are a lot of nuances involved in its interpretation. So I've talked a lot about individual exciting planets, individual discoveries, points here and there on the sky. But in addition to these discoveries, we've also started to figure out some trends in the population, which bodes well if our eventual goal is understanding atmospheres as an astrophysical object, a concept, a thing. So of these trends, some of them more putative than others, one of my favorites that I'm trying to keep track of is a water trend that some people are talking about. And I might be a bit biased being a human and needing water and all that, but I think it's an example of how we're starting to see these population level trends emerge as we add more and more data points to the picture. And the idea to this trend is that as you crank up the mass of your planet, you'll actually have less water in your atmosphere. One thing I will point out though, is that we don't have all that many data points here. In fact, we have so few data points that you can actually make out the names of some of these planets. And the reason that there are so many, so few data points in that plot is that we are actually quite data limited right now when it comes to thinking about exoplanet atmospheres. So if we think about all the exoplanets that we've discovered, depending on your definition of confirmed, we've confirmed around 4,300 of them. Of those, we have only characterized the atmospheres of 3% of them. So it's a very difficult task that we're undertaking to try and understand exoplanets at a population level, because it's really hard to get enough data points to really say something interesting about it. Hopefully that'll change in the near future, as we'll talk about in a bit. But even the data that we have can sometimes be limited. So previously, the plot that I had shown before and some of these models, which model an atmosphere at, that's fully composed of methane, fully composed of water, fully composed of CO2, all of those models and that previous data they tend to show a lot of variation. There's bumps and wiggles, and they're very characteristic. It's easy to tell one thing from another. But sometimes when you look at the actual data, they don't really represent that variability. And we tend to see some of these features that are much more muted than we'd expect. Even the CO2 line, which fits the data relatively well over here, crosses through many of these points, start to see some disagreement around the 1.6 micron region. And that is a little worrying for people who would like to extract as much information as possible from their spectrum. And if you kind of tilt your head sideways and you look at that dotted gray line in the background, 
you could maybe convince yourself, actually, that looks like it could just be a flat line, maybe. So the reason that this flat line uh, profile might be created is due to something that is actually a little familiar to us. It's not some deep physics esoteric reason. It's actually probably because of clouds in great part. So clouds, we have them on the Earth. And it turns out that their presence can mute the variability in our data that we would expect from the gaseous atoms, from the gaseous molecules that we'd expect. And to show this, I have a composite image over here, not of an exoplanet, but of Titan, which is a moon in our own solar system. And it motivates a significant problem because we can't see through this atmosphere down to the surface of Titan. There are all these carbon-based hazes just kind of sit and kind of muck up all of the understanding that we could gain about the gaseous constituents of its atmosphere. So between clouds and hazes, clouds and hazes, it looks like we have some confounding variables in terms of understanding what's going on from a gaseous perspective. So I've talked a lot about the present. We kind of have a sense of where the field is right now some of the more exciting things that have been discovered and trends that are emerging from the population. But there's a lot of really exciting things that are on the horizon. Namely, the James Webb Space Telescope. And before we move on, I would just like to let this image marinate for a bit. It really is a magnificent piece of hardware. It's taken billions of dollars to make it. Years, many, many, many people, all of their work combined to create this space telescope. And it's set to radically alter the way that we look at exoplanets. No more, we hope, will we be confined to that data from before that don't tell us as much as we'd like about an exoplanet atmosphere. We'll have unprecedented insight into new physics and new chemistry, all of which very, very interesting. So what about it? What about the James Webb Space Telescope is all that interesting? And we can kind of tease that out by comparing it to its spiritual predecessor, the Hubble Space Telescope, which, as we might know, over the past few decades has really produced a lot of striking astronomical images. So the idea of the James Webb Space Telescope is primarily that it has a different wavelength coverage. So we talked earlier about being able to exploit the color dependence of the shadows of exoplanets to tease out what's inside their atmospheres. And with Hubble, the colors that we can look at are including the visible light, that is the type of radiation that our eyes can see, and some of the infrared as well. By contrast, James Webb Space Telescope operates entirely in the infrared, extending all the way out to a wavelength range that Hubble didn't have access to. And because of that, we can explore entirely different physics and be able to understand the roles of different molecules that Hubble wasn't necessarily as sensitive to. Some colors, as it turns out, are actually better than others if we're interested in exoplanet atmospheres. Additionally, there's the question of thermal stability, which is really, really, really important if you're going to be observing with an infrared space telescope. And one way that James Webb achieves this thermal stability is by cooling its detectors. One of its detectors is cooled down to five degrees Kelvin, that's five degrees above absolute zero. So that's the type of precision that we're talking about that can really get us something interesting in terms of better and new data. Finally, there's the simple fact of mirror size. They're able to collect more light. James Webb, roughly two and a half meters. Uh, HST, two and a half meters. James Webb, six and a half meters. So that's a really striking difference in terms of its ability to resolve things spatially be able to see more and see better. So in addition to all of this new instrumentation that's coming our way, ideally, we're going to be something, seeing something else that comes with this. And to kind of frame what that something else is, I'd like to talk briefly about what's known as SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Contact, if you haven't seen that movie, it's a great watch. Something that some other people think about, though, adjacent to the SETI crew, 
is not the search for life that need be intelligent. It's, you know, the search for life that is maybe unintelligent, but is still, you know, interesting in terms of placing humanity in the cosmos. So these people, they're not looking for aliens that are gonna come shoot lasers at us or reveal the answer to the universe. They're looking instead for microbes, algae, anything that might have an effect on an atmosphere. And those effects on an atmosphere from life are termed biosignatures. So the search for biosignatures, it's becoming increasingly interdisciplinary because the gist of this is to find things that life does that can't be mimicked by natural processes that are detectable and that are abundant. And these things that life does can often come in pairs. For example, we might say, oh, we're looking for this pairing of methane and carbon monoxide in this way, and that would be indicative of life, perhaps. This pairing of oxygen and carbon monoxide together might be evidence of some form of life. But again, this is an interdisciplinary endeavor because we need to talk to the biologists and ask them, hey, what does life do? And then we need to go talk to the geologists and say, hey, what does a volcano do that could potentially mimic what life does? And then we need to go to the engineers and say, well, we need you to build something, please, that allows us to differentiate between this case and this case. And then we need to send a telescope up, analyze the data with the requisite statistics to actually tell the difference between different scenarios. So the question of what life produces, difficult enough in and of its own. How a dead planet can mimic the processes of life from a gaseous perspective, also difficult. And as I've talked about, we're not looking at an image of the Earth that looks like this, or like this, or even this. We're just looking at blobs that are hundreds of light years away from us. So it's very difficult from a statistics and data perspective as well. Finally, in terms of being able to differentiate, very, very difficult task. But it's ultimately a worthwhile one, because if we were able to say, hey, we found evidence that there's algae on another planet. For me, that would probably be the best news to possibly wake up to. So to somewhat summarize the discussion, we found so far a number of elements and molecules that are in exoplanet atmospheres. We found water, sodium, iron, and hydrogen, just to name a few of them. We found evidence of clouds, just like on the Earth and some solar system planets. And as we might expect, these clouds aren't just encasing their planets in a simple, naive case. They're patchy. They change over time, which makes things complicated. But again, the flip side of things makes them interesting to study from a physics perspective. We've also found a variety of temperature and wind structures that are surprising, given what we know about the solar system. We're beginning to fold in, in addition, our understanding of how surfaces play a role going back to our discussion of magma oceans. We've also found, unfortunately, data that are really difficult to work with. But because in part of this difficult data that we have, we're also excited to look to the future and see much better telescopes in space and on the ground. And hopefully, fingers crossed, knock on wood, biosignatures far out into the future as well. Thank you so much for listening. I will now take questions that people have. Okay, Arjun. Hi, I'm George. I will be reading the questions out to you. Great, thank you. Okay. First question comes from Cliff, Cliff Ashcraft. Sounds like solid iron would deposit on the cold side of the planet. Mountains of distilled iron, amazing. That's a great... Um... Was that the entirety of the question or? That was the comment, yeah. Comment, awesome. Yes, so that's a great point, thinking about these mountains of iron. Because you're right, the rain, once the iron rains out on the cold side, again, not going to magically disappear, it has to go somewhere. But the question of mountains, that's an interesting one. Because we don't exactly know what the interior structure of WASP-76b might be. We don't know exactly where there's a hard surface onto which these iron bits could deposit and form mountains. 
ideally we'd be able to get that level of granularity at some point in the future. But I think it just speaks to the idea that there are these really interesting concepts that were just on the horizon of being able to understand. So yeah, really great point. Next question comes from John Kazimbo. On the Iron Planet, it appears that the center of the planet would continuously move towards the star as the surface vaporizes and is redeposited on the far side of the planet. Is this accurate? So in terms of, I believe you're talking about the planet migrating inward toward the star. And as far as we know, that hasn't been detected. And I believe that the observations that we made, uh, there were very high fidelity observations actually taken on the espresso instrument on I hope I get this right, the Very Large Telescope, um, the VLT, um, or yes, I think it's the VLT. But this is really a state-of-the-art observation that's been made. And based off of those observations, we likely would have been able to tell if there was appreciable movement inward toward the star. And as far as we know, that's not currently the case. Okay, next question is from Jim Nordhausen. What is the orbital period of HD 80606? Ooh, that's a great question that I should know the answer to. I'm going to say it's definitely not a long period planet. And by long period, I'm thinking of anything on the order of a year. Um, so I'm going to say it's roughly, I'm gonna say it's on the order of 30 days, but I'm not entirely sure, that's a good question. Okay, our next question comes from Ananya Nagaretti, who I, Ananya, I've enabled your mic and you're uh, welcome to ask the question directly. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, what was the reason for using golden beryllium together for the primary mirrors of the James Webb Space Telescope. I know that gold is a good reflector of infrared, infrared rays, but I wanted to ask um, what beryllium does to do ca to capture um, different wavelengths. That's a great question. Um, so I can think of a number of reasons that we would dope uh, the gold with beryllium in order to use it for a space telescope. Um, the primary reason I'm going to say is that gold, like pure gold in and of itself, is um, not very robust. And you want to send very robust things onto your space telescope when you launch it into space, which, you know, despite your best efforts, is going to be a difficult process. So in terms of making it more robust mirror material, I'm going to say that that's part of it. In terms of um, being able to better the mirror properties um, in terms of reflecting infrared light, can't speak to that, but given how much that's been put into web, I would say that there's definitely a good reason from a wavelength perspective. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have three comments after that. Uh, Jim, Jim adds uh, to this last question that um, beryllium adds hardness. Great. And uh, Charlie Rule comments that uh, Excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Akin Ng uh, comments, very interesting. And then Brian McGinnis uh, comments, the exoplanet.eu site gives the orbital period of HD 80606b as 111.43637 days. All righty, so somewhere between my guess and a year. <laughs> okay, uh, Jeremy Carla posted a, a, a final question. Oh, and Mary Lou West also adds one. Okay, we've got a series of questions streaming in here. Awesome. Jeremy Carla says, if a planet is in spin orbit lock, what breaks the symmetry to move the hottest point of the substellar point? Why do the winds blow one way and not the other way in the absence of tides and rapid rotation? 
That's a really good question. And so the symmetry breaking comes down to the orbital or rather um, the axial rotation of the planet. So actually go all the way back. Um, we can see that the hottest point on the planet is invected in the same direction as the rotation of the planet. So granted, these are super rotational winds such that you have a planet rotating some frequency and these winds are going around much more quickly than that. But that tends to be the symmetry break. Otherwise, I imagine that there'd be a lot of uh, friction between whatever constitutes a surface and the flow of the winds. Okay, um, question from Mary Lou West. How many Earth-like planets are there? That definitely depends on who you ask. <laughs> Some people, um, perhaps myself included at this point, are becoming or are very strict when it comes to calling something Earth-like. And they would reserve that term for something that we know for a fact is rocky and has liquid water on its surface, let alone a variety of other features that we haven't even begun to consider yet. Other people um, might adopt a definition of plus or minus 20% the Earth's radius and plus or minus 20% the light that it receives from the sun, that we receive from the sun. Adopting that definition, I would say that there's something on the order of between 10 and 30. Though, hopefully, we should be able to find more of these planets with the TESS satellite that is currently searching for a bunch of new exoplanets all over the sky. So it's definitely an evolving figure over time. Hopefully rapidly increasing, not decreasing. So that leads to a question that I have here. Um, so if there's between 10 and 30, that have been observed. Uh, if you were to make an estimate based on the full scale of the known universe, like where would you take that? What's the real number or an estimated an, number? Yeah, that's an incredible question. And so that question comes down to something called exoplanet occurrence rates. And that has been really a focus of the field for perhaps the last decade, um, definitely in the post-Kepler era is when we've had access to a real statistical sample where we can start to say, well, this is how frequent Earth-like planets are. And based off of some work that I did last year, building off of a decade and a half of work, we're thinking that that frequency of Earth-like, again, by that generous definition, Earth-like planets per sun-like stars should be somewhere between 0.1 and up to point four is what I would say recently I've seen. So there's still some disagreement, but I would say that generously we could go down between point one and one Earth-like planets per sun-like stars. And when you extrapolate that out, we can first extrapolate that frequency to the Milky Way. There are roughly 300 billion stars in the Milky Way. Not all, all of them are sun-like. Um, but let's pretend that 100 billion of them are, just for the Stott experiment. And so based off of that, we should have on the order of 1 billion Earth-like, generously, planets just in the Milky Way alone. And when you start to extrapolate this out to a universal scale, I would say that things start to get a little bit murkier for two reasons. First of which, we only have statistics on exoplanets within the Milky Way all, almost all, the exoplanets that have been observed and detected are within our Milky Way galaxy. There have been some reports of bulk numbers of exoplanets in other galaxies. And there has been one detection actually just a couple months ago about a planet that was transiting a bright X-ray source in another galaxy. Um, so I actually don't know if that's been peer reviewed yet, but the idea is that we do think that there are planets in other galaxies. And based off of what we're seeing in our own galaxy, like there should be, but we have no idea whether our galaxy is different from other galaxies in terms of it being better for hosting planets or worse for hosting planets. 
because there are vast discrepancies between galaxies. Some of them are much more metal rich than others. Some of them are forming a lot of new stars and some are relatively dormant. So the differences in planet formation between different galaxies, I would say, while theoretically people have definitely poked and prodded in this area, we don't have a lot to go on observation. of. That being said, my cop-out answer to the question of how many habitable or how many Earth-like planets are there in the universe, I would say the answer is nearly infinite. Um, because what we know from a cosmological perspective that the universe is for all intents and purposes essentially spatially infinite. That being said, the observable universe is finite based off of light travel time. Um, I don't have a number for the observable universe, but again, my cop-out answer for the entire universe, infinite. Follow-up question comes from Scott G. How do you validate, in quotes, the model and method? The model and methods of detecting planets. I would say one, the, the most important way to validate, and this is what some people would call the old fashioned way, is to do it from two different methods. So in the talk today, I focused primarily on the transit method, waiting for that shadow of the exoplanet to cross us. But another, this I would say the second most common method is called the radial velocity method, the Doppler wobble method. And it exploits the physical fact that as a planet and a planet orbits a star, that star isn't actually stationary because both objects are actually orbiting their common center of mass. So if we're watching the star over time, it should actually wobble toward and away, toward and away from us. And then we can fold in this fact of how light works, this Doppler effect, that if something emitting light is moving toward you, that light's gonna look a little bluer, a little redder, a little bluer. So we can exploit this variability and say, okay, based off of this fact that this star is moving toward, away, toward, away from us, it's likely a planet orbiting it, and they're both orbiting a common center of mass. So that, that radial velocity method combined with the transit method is nominally the way that we use to validate these methods against each other and also to validate an individual planet. Because if you see a transit, if I see a transit out there in the galaxy, I might want to think that it's a planet, but there's a number of astrophysical false positives that it could be. Um, for example, it could be two stars co-orbiting one another, and one just kind of nips the edge of the other, leading to a decrease in brightness that we might attribute to a planet. In addition to all the astrophysical false positives, you can have an instrumental false positive, my favorite of which um, was called the Kepler rolling bands. Um, sorry for the long tangent, but I love this story. So when Kepler, Kepler spacecraft is looking for Earth-like planets orbiting sun-like stars. And after the first couple of years of data, people looked at each other and said, wow, we're, we're getting a lot of signal at around one year at about the signal depth of an Earth-sized planet. There's a lot of Earth-like planets out there. But the problem is the Kepler spacecraft was on a heliocentric orbit. And sometimes it would get a little closer to the sun and sometimes a little farther from the sun. And that thermal variation mimicked a transit signal. So there's a lot of ways in which you could get fake transit signals in which you need this other method to buttress it. Final note on this, um, because I know I've harped on this question a lot, but it's a great question. In addition to using these two physical methods, the radial velocity against the transit method, in the past, I'd say five years, people have also turned to something called statistical validation, taking advantage of the fact that we know now how exoplanets exist in the Milky Way. And we know what the sources of false positives could be. So taking the data that we looked at and also some additional follow-up data, we can statistically rule out some false positive scenarios and say, okay, based off of this data, some complementary data, I'm sure this is a planet with 95% confidence. But that field I would say is still not as desired as the radial velocity method. That's really like the, the gold star that's what you would want to truly validate your plan.
All right, Scotchy uh, sent in a final follow-up. My concern was the atmosphere models of these planets. How can you constrain them toward an answer that is likely true, but lacks conformity data? For example, we can go there. I would say, um, so validating the atmospheric models, I'm so sorry that I spent so long answering a different question then. <laughs> the atmospheric models, I would say that, and you're right, we can't go there and visit and scoop up a little bit of atmosphere and say, hey, I was right. Um, so on some level, it comes down to trust in the physics, knowing that certain elements are going to be characteristic in the way that they absorb light. Just knowing that that fact about nature is going to help us out. But the problem is there are, and I've definitely alluded to this a couple of times, there's a lot of complicating factors. And sometimes depending on the model you use and the statistical analysis you use, you're gonna arrive at different answers. That's why, for example, different teams came up with water versus methane for K218b, exploiting the same physics Everyone agrees on how atoms work, on molecules work, and yet when we apply that physical knowledge to data, we can arrive at different answers. So in terms of understanding what's the ground truth, what is this atmosphere exactly? I would say, I think that depends on how good your data are. If you have really good data, then you can be much more confident that what you have said is in an atmosphere really truly is there. But you know, you might not also get the entire picture of things. Maybe you can get some data that's pretty good. So you can say, yes, there's iron in there and something else, but I can't tell you what it is. So there are a lot, there's a lot of gray area between not knowing what's there and knowing exactly what's there with absolute certainty. And I would say we're still relatively far away from being absolutely certain. So you bring up a very good point. It's difficult to know truly, truly, truly what's there using remote sensing observations. Great, thank you, Arjun. Uh, so each of your answers seem to be inspiring more questions. So uh, Mary Lou, I've enabled your mic. You can ask your question directly. So I wondered if you could tell us more about the phosphine problem and why they thought they found it on Venus and then they didn't. Absolutely. So the phosphine problem to recap, um, for people who might not have heard about it, um, I believe it was a couple months ago now, or maybe just a month, that a team of scientists reported the detection of phosphine on Venus. And they ruled out in their analysis the number of ways in which you could create phosphine. And they ruled them all out and they said, well, we don't really know how that phosphine got there. Maybe, maybe it's life. Maybe it was created by life. And so this is related to the um, biosignature question that I was talking about, right? Where we have these ways in which a quote unquote dead planet, excuse all the slides, ways in which a dead planet quote unquote could fool us into thinking that life is there. So um, the reason that people have gone back and forth about the phosphine question is a number of reasons. So after this detection, first of all, which was made by some very, very well-respected scientists, uh, many of whom I knew of individually, really respected them. Um, the first series of papers that came out as a rebuttal or rather a response took issue with the data themselves and saying that the way in which the data went from the telescope to you, once you got the data, that data was already not good. There were some wobbles in the data that were artificial and due to the instrument. So one series of papers said, look, it's just an instrumental problem. Another group of people said, I don't like the way that you analyzed your data. Um, we believe that you're overfitting and trying to shove a lot of trends in there to explain something that isn't actually physical. Um, for people who are interested um, and who might benefit from knowing this, there was a fitting of a 12th order polynomial that some people took issue with. So the idea is that you can 
stack a bunch of functions to kind of explain away your data and come away with a conclusion that might not be statistically warranted. So some people said, OK, your analysis, I don't like what you did there. Yet another group of people said, OK, let's say that there is phosphine on Venus. There wasn't an issue with the instrument, wasn't an issue with the analysis. Let's say there is phosphine there. We don't agree with your interpretation of it. Because just because there is an unexplained chemical signature in a planet does not necessarily mean that there's life there. And I, in explaining this, would tend to appeal to Occam's razor, which states that the least complex answer is likely often the true one. And the least complex answer is that, you know, we simply don't understand the chemistry of what's going on in Venus. Chemistry is really, really, really hard to figure out, even as it turns out for a next door neighbor. So it's much more likely that we just didn't fully model the chemical processes and we mixed or rather we missed some natural process occurring on Venus that we didn't know or don't know occurs on terrestrial rocky planets. Because phosphine can form naturally on a gas giant like Jupiter, I believe. There are natural processes on Jupiter that can form phosphine without life. And we understand those relatively well. So again, these people said, look, even if there's phosphine, it's something abiotic going on. So that's. I would say a recap of why there have been some back and forths about whether or not there's phosphine on Venus, and if there is, what it means. But what I will say is that Venus is a very difficult target to observe, and we're really pushing our instruments to the limits to be able to make a very sensitive detection on a target that is so bright in the sky. So it's a difficult problem to solve, but I think that it's one worth uh, waiting for, right? Because if we did find phosphine, and if it is for a biotic reason, I would be very, very, very happy. The question is whether it is actually there. And returning to the question earlier, we don't, as of yet, really, really, really know it's there. But I'm happy to see that it's inspired a lot of talk about Venus, a lot of talk about atmosphere of a planet, and what it means, and um, hopefully future research in that direction. I think a couple countries might have announced manned missions to Venus afterward, um, or unmanned. But uh, yeah, uh, that's my take in my summary of the Venus back and forth. All right, well, that concludes uh, all the questions. Uh, Arjun, thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Uh, that thank said, so uh, Mary, I'll, I'll turn it to you. Yes, Arjun, thank you for speaking to us tonight. It was excellent. Really enjoyed it. Uh, and I wanted to thank everyone for joining us tonight. And just um, a couple of announcements here. Our weekly presentations will resume on Friday, January 8th. We're going to take the next two Fridays off due to the holidays. And um, so we'll, con we'll resume again on January 8th. That's three weeks from now. It'll be the What's Up talk. Uh, a down-to-earth sky guide about what you can see up in the night sky for the month of January. Um, also, a reminder, our January 15th, 2021 monthly speaker is Dr. Dan Werthemer from Berkeley, um, and the title of his presentation is, Is Anybody Out There? So with that, I'm wishing everyone a safe and happy holiday season, and all the best in the new year. Thank you. <laughs>